You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. Welcome to Both Sides of the Prescription with your host, Dr. Megan and Dr. Ron. Both Sides of the Prescription brings together Dr. Megan and Dr. Ron to discuss pertinent medical issues from both an alternative and traditional medicine perspective. So now, please welcome the hosts of Both Sides of the Prescription, Dr. Megan and Dr. Ron. Welcome, everybody, to Both Sides of the Prescription radio show on BBM Global, Tune In, and iHeartRadio. I am your host, Dr. Megan Kirschling, and I am joined by my co-host, who also serves as my father, Dr. Ron Kirschling. Good evening, Dad. Well, good evening, Megan. It's uh, good to be back on uh, after a couple weeks off. Uh, certainly fun weeks for me. I was on vacation. Yeah, you went to Alaska, went up north a little bit, eh? Uh, yeah, and we did go to Canada A, eh? and then from from Vancouver A, eh, we went through the inner passageway up to uh, up to uh, actually uh, ultimately Anchorage, and um, I had I'd never seen that part of uh, the world, um, not that part of the United States, and uh, it's uh, it's spectacular. Yeah, it, obviously I've talked to you since you've come back, and I think you would recommend that more people check that part of the country out. Oh, I definitely, I would um, I would suggest it would be a worthwhile thing for anybody to put on their bucket list. Well, you know, we get together every Wednesday. We've taken, uh, like you were saying, a couple Wednesdays off. Um, just for some summer activities and vacations and 4th of Julys and things like that. Um, but we are back, and tonight we are going to talk about laughter and the necessity really to include laughter both for social connection and just for well-being and uh, longevity of life into your you know daily regimen. Uh, we usually, though, before we get going on our conversation, like to tell you a little bit about why we're even here, what brought the two of us together besides genetics and being father and daughter to do a radio show. And it really comes from the fact that um, I was born in a family of traditional medicine. My dad uh, is an oncologist, hematologist, and a traditionally trained doctor. And my mom um, spent some years as a nurse before moving over to a real estate agent. But uh, growing up in that environment and growing up um, with medicine and health and having a couple of my own little hiccups in the health and wellness world for me personally growing up, um, I realized that there was a lot of power in medicine and that it really was a great thing to get into and you know wanting to help people. But somewhere along the way, and I don't even know really fully where this happened, I became curious about uh, what some would consider in a traditionally raised family with medicine, the dark side of alternative medicine uh, with chiropractic, uh, you know, acupuncture, nutrition, those kind of things. I will state as a disclaimer that my dad never made this seem like the dark side. But I have, you know, gotten some feedback from people that a lot of traditionally trained doctors feel this is the dark side. And I realized that there was a lot of power in alternative medicine and there were a lot of truths and there was a lot of necessity and need for it. However, that didn't mean that there wasn't a place and reason for what we consider more traditional or allopathic medicine. And I really wanted to merge these two things together, not to discredit one to prove the other or to just look at one and not really explore the other. So through my training, uh, going to chiropractic school, um, becoming a nurse practitioner in both women's health and family practice, 
Um, obviously, the background before that with nursing, uh, I'm a clinical certified clinical nutritionist, and my background is a master's with my nutrition degree. That I really did realize that for the best care possible, um, and for really finding answers for both myself and my patients, we needed to look at both sides. And I really thoroughly enjoyed talking about both sides, learning about both sides. So I wanted to have these conversations for others to listen to. And I had to look no further than my family tree to find the person that would best suit the need to have these conversations and look at both sides. And that was my father, Dr. Ron Kirschling. So Megan, a couple of things I was thinking about as you were talking there. And, um, I think I think you're absolutely right. If I reflect back um, on my life as a physician and a lot of that as a medical oncologist, uh, when I first uh, now 30 years ago uh, became certified as a medical oncologist, I think at that time um, there was a, a, a real sincere desire on on the part of traditional medicine to to try to find solutions for the cancer problem and the you know the thought process that this went through was a scientific model which um, suggested that if we were going to find breakthroughs it was likely going to occur because we could show from patient to patient to patient a benefit and um, in 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 really a specialty that was very new. I, I think that uh, there was almost a, a ferocious need to make sure that what we were practicing were things that we could scientifically verify. And in that setting, you are you are absolutely right. Um, if if it didn't have scientific backing, um, it 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 was felt, to not be only not acceptable, but frankly, to be dangerous. Uh, an example that I would give is uh, the use of laetrile. And um, it used to be a, a supplement that was used outside of the United States. Um, most of the patients that, that I was aware of would go down to Mexico for it. And Eventually, it was elected to, to test this under scientific methods, uh, and uh, this was uh, being done while I was actually going through my fellowship. And the results of those studies was that, that they couldn't prove that it was of benefit, and um, and there there was uh, an an absolute wall that was put up between what we could prove scientifically and uh, by looking at groups of people and um, and what was it now what's interesting is is fortunately I think that while there still has been an interest in scientifically studying things and I, I think that's entirely appropriate we're we're beginning more and more on the traditional side to realize how personalized uh, our care has to be and uh, that while we can look at groups, we also have to understand that we're all, all unique individuals. And and frankly, from follow, my following you, Megan, I think that's you know one of the strong things that that I've seen in your training that you try to provide for your clients in integrative medicine, and that is uh, it, taking each person as an individual. And uh, so I think that um, although this is uh, Going in uh, fits and spurts. I, 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 um, I still think that there is uh, a, a ways for us to go. I, I do think that we're beginning to see communication and appreciation of a, uh, of a variety of healthcare providers. Mm-hmm. Well, and it's interesting because I really think that. One of the things I've noticed from being in the clinical setting is that as we spend more time with patients and really let the education that we get from the beginning meet clinical practice and what we see with people, I think it's interesting because of the conversation we're going to have tonight, I think fits into the fact that 
as we get more and more into, or at least I should say I, get more and more into clinical practice now with, you know, a little bit over a decade of time spent with patients, is that one of the things I realize is that diet and lifestyle and individualization um, and some of the things that are more basic, um, some of the things that uh, are things that we might not really we wouldn't be trained to include them in a treatment plan like laughter and getting outside and being with nature. And, you know, meditation is a little bit more, you know, with quotation marks around it, trendy, but things like that, that, you know, might not have as much research or research that's being displayed in uh, medical schools, that these are the things in the foundation and the things that we shouldn't be leaving out of treatment plans. And, uh, you know, we're going to talk tonight about the new Time Magazine special editions. We've talked about a couple in the past that have had to do with meditation and exercise and things like that. Tonight's um, special edition of Time is the science of laughter, our bodies, our minds, our souls. Uh, and I found this, uh, I think, last week. So it's a new one that just came out um, and purchased one for you and I to read about the science of laughter. But it's interesting to me because I often say as we find the latest and greatest and we look at... You, um, research and we look at evidence-based clinical care, a lot of times we do that at the cost of the foundation and the basics. And we should not throw those things out. We shouldn't look, we shouldn't throw out the importance of smiling and laughing and exercise and diet and lifestyle and time with nature and meditation uh, at the expense of saying, let's not do this. Let's just do surgeries and medication and those things that it really should be a comprehensive and individual approach to each person. Well, I've mentioned this uh, before, but it always seems a point that's important to make is that uh, when I, for example, went through medical school and did my training, uh, we learned complex systems which continue um, to, to evolve in our knowledge of, but we we really felt that those systems were all independent of each other, that there wasn't a lot of crosstalk um, and that um, and that they were kind of hardened systems. And if we couldn't explain something by looking at that one system, uh, it came to doubt as to whether, you know, whether or not it was an illness. Um, and I think what is evolving and is becoming something that's accepted as a foundation uh, is the idea that um, that all of our systems are interconnected, and w- and what that ultimately means is that um, there are scientific document there's scientific documentation to suggest that mind, body, and soul um, all are interrelated, and uh, if we then begin to accept that, you know everything is on the table. Mm-hmm. Um, you know it's it's not just enzyme uh, uh, biochemistry, but but it is lifestyle. And um, all of these things um, are right to view. And, and honestly, from a practical standpoint, uh, our patients, our clients, uh, have always felt this way. Mm-hmm. You know, they've, they've, when dealing with a significant illness, um, they, want everything possible done to help make them well. And some of that may be specific medications or supplements, but um, a lot of it is a better relationship with exercise, with diet, um, spiritual spiritual issues, uh, the experience of joy, laughter. So I don't think we, um, I think hopefully we're taking much more seriously the importance of these things. Mm-hmm. And I think that, a simple, you know, thing that is stated that is true is every interaction we have during the day, everything we eat, every movement we make, you know, who we surround ourselves by, all of those things turn into chemical reactions in our body. And that chemical reaction is very different if it's a positive chemical reaction or if it's a negative chemical reaction, depending on what we're exposing ourselves to. So that's why it is all important. And I think it's going to be really interesting to get into this conversation about laughter because laughter is one of the ways that we can socially connect to people 
um, more. It's one of the ways that we can communicate. Um, one of the um, ongoing themes in this Time magazine is about the importance of laughter when it comes to communication. And this is how we do become more communi- or connected to people and really form deep connections. Yes, I think you're right. Um, this is uh, this has been an area that I've been um, I've been interested in. Gosh, I think almost all all of my professional life, and uh, maybe when we start out the ne- next segment, I'll talk about that a little bit. Perfect. So let's break here for our first commercial. Stick with us as we get into more about the science of laughter and what we can all do every day to laugh more and be healthier. You're listening to Both Sides of the Prescription on BBM Global, Tune In, and iHeart Radio. Dr. Rob Moyer is the director of the Ocean River Institute, and he is passionate about saving the ocean by helping dolphins suffering from nitrogen pollution. Nitrogen is a dangerous pollutant, affecting our oceans, altering ocean ecosystems, and contributing to global warming. The Ocean River Institute provides opportunities to make a difference and encourages people to go the distance for savvy stewardship of a greater and bluer planet Earth. Partnered with organizations from Massachusetts to Florida, Alaska to the Caribbean, the Ocean River Institute's mission is to foster involvement in conservation and environmental monitoring by facilitating grassroots efforts at local and regional levels. Hello, I'm Rob Moyer of the Ocean River Institute. Please visit our website at oceanriver.org. Sign up for free e-alerts. You may call us at 617-661-6647. Our email address is info at Ocean River. Become informed and then act with us. Thank you. Joseph A. Moylan is the owner of Ion Health, which specializes in very unique medical devices. Ion Health offers biomats, alkalife, and frequency machines. Biomats are a far infrared and negative ion emitting FDA approved medical device. With many different sizes available, you can place them on your bed, on a massage table, or on a seat in your car. It is an unobtrusive way to health. Alkalife machines are water ionizers that cleanse and raise the alkalinity of your tap water, making high alkaline water. Frequency machines utilize certain frequencies to kill viruses and bacteria. These devices are safe and effective. Coming from a health-conscious background and studying physiology at the Academy of Natural Health, Joseph A. Moylan has 15 years of experience in the health field and wants to help you live a healthy, long life. Visit www.ionhealthbiomats.weebly.com or call 765-520-2988. Don't let your health go astray. Get in touch today. Welcome back, everybody, to Both Sides of the Prescription radio show. As we get into the conversation about the science of laughter and the importance of connection through laughter, if you guys have any questions, comments, or want to join in on the conversation, call 866-451-1451. So, Megan, I don't want to uh, bore our audience, but um, I mentioned that um, this has really been an area that I've been uh, very interested in. Uh, for a long time. And um, if I go back actually quite a while, I um, when I finished my, my actual training, um, I was in the uh, military for a number of years. And uh, in the, I'm trying to think of these dates so I don't screw them up. In the 1990s, uh, as you know, um, I got out of the military and uh, we went to Duluth, Minnesota, where I was in practice for um, for about 15 years. And um, soon after I arrived there, I met uh, a social worker on the oncology or, or the cancer floor, and um, we became close friends. Now, the interesting thing of, about this man um who I'm going to give a fictitious name, Jim. But um, the thing about Jim is that um, he really had a remarkable backstory in that um, he had been a Marine uh, actually during the Vietnam War. Um, If anyone's familiar with the Vietnam War, they may remember Khe Song, but it was a famous battle and um, a very, very difficult battle, which he was in. And actually, he served more than one tour as a active Marine in Vietnam, and he survived that. Uh, but uh, in coming coming home, uh, 
one evening, less than a year after he got back to the United States, uh, he was hit by a drunk driver. And uh, although they were able to save his life, um, they had to actually, uh, they caused damage which severed his spinal cord. Or I guess you could say that they weren't able to, to save the in, from the injury. And so he was paralyzed. Um, he had uh, use of his arms, but he was, uh, uh, he was in a wheelchair. Now, the remarkable thing about Jim was that um, you couldn't be with him literally for more than 30 seconds and you forgot that he was in a wheelchair because nothing about him uh, suggested that he was going to be limited by his injury or his wheelchair. And uh, one of his uh, secret um, desires I guess you would say it was on his bucket list is that um, he wanted to be the he wanted to be a comedian or a stand up stand up comic. But as he would say, um, he'd have to be a, a, a sit down comic. Um, and and we uh, very soon after I got to Duluth, because of my feeling about the importance of humor in my interaction with my cancer patients and uh, and the feeling of the importance that humor had been for him in terms of of surviving and and continuing to have a kind of a right attitude towards his injury um we decided to put together a humor program and uh, fortunately at that time the hospital that we were working with uh, let us put together kind of a seminar uh, that was open to all the employees, and uh, probably over a period of about ten years, Jim and I did. Um, uh, for anybody that would listen, we would do humor conferences. He would talk about um, how important humor had been for him with his injury and his recovery and his day-to-day living, and I would talk about humor in uh, in relationship to taking care of cancer patients and how, how important I felt it was for them to feel that they could have humor in their life. Um, we would, uh, we would tell some jokes. Um, we, um, actually did the famous Abbott and Costello who's on first, uh, fully dressed in baseball uniforms. Uh, and honestly, I still as, uh, strongly believe, uh, today, that uh, what we did back then and what we were trying to express is probably even more important um, in, in terms of what we can do for our patients. Mm-hmm. What, so from that background and just your background, you know, 35 plus years um, treating cancer patients, how important do you think that laughter and attitude is in the whole healing process and where they're at. Well, I don't, I, I don't want to, I don't want to say it's everything, but I, um, I, I think it's a tremendous amount, uh, and I actually counsel patients that if um, th- that that their attitude is so important that if for some reason um, my care of them or the, or the cancer center's care of them or the hospital's care of them does not allow them to have um, the best attitude they can towards the cancer, that I will help them find another provider who, who they can fit with best. Mm-hmm. So, so I, um, I and, and I think, um, well, I've always intuitively felt that it's very hard to help someone unless they're really motivated to get the best outcome. You know, I think now, um, as we've talked about, uh, this isn't uh, th- this is this is something that more and more scientifically we're finding is true. That you know, the the attitude a person has, um, the the condition of their mind affects the condition of their body. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think it is absolutely critical. Um, And I consider it one of the most important things that I have to try to accomplish is to try to help that person get um, 
I guess you might say, a right attitude towards uh, fighting um, the the situation that they're in. Mm-hmm. Now, and I think, oh, go ahead. Now the you know the 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 other thing um, is that, and I think the area where the laughter comes into play is. Um, in, in two ways, I guess I would say. One way that it comes into play is that, um, you know, dealing with something like cancer is a profoundly complex thing for people to handle. And there's no way that they um, they go into it without having all sorts of uh, mixed emotions about uh, what's happened to them. And if you can place a person in a situation where their uh, positive emotions can be displayed, um, that allows them, uh, I think, a, a capacity to feel some relief from this terrible burden of having cancer. And I truly believe that that if one's ability to express themselves uh, can be done in a in a positive fashion, um, that's a more strong position to to work from. The other thing that I would say about laughter is that um, another very component for me of the care of a patient is the feeling by the patient that they're coming into an atmosphere where they want to be, where they feel that they can be themselves where they feel comfortable. And if you're in a situation where you're, you're allowing people to laugh, um, I, I think that they, they feel um, it, it allows them to feel uh, more comfortable. The, the final thing that patients have told me is that, you know, dealing with this ultra serious, in my case, condition such as cancer, you know, you don't have to lay it on the patient that they have cancer. They know how serious it is. They know that it's potentially life-threatening. And frankly, they oftentimes they are so appreciative of the idea that they could, they can maybe laugh again. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, they have said to me, well, gosh, if this, doc- if this doctor is um, sharing with me things and I'm sharing with them and we're laughing, you know, maybe this situation isn't all bad. You know, may- maybe I can get through this. And I-, I think the laughter is a form of hope for the patient. Yeah, and I think that, well, it's interesting because even the article talks about one of the major things about laughter is that social connection. And so it would seem, too, that not only are you saying a lot uh, with the laughter part and bringing that into the treatment and the care that you're providing, but also connecting you a little bit quicker to say that you're sort of in this together. Um, and I think that that's the interesting thing about laughter when we look at some of the things that the Time Magazine tells us about is that laughter really can connect us pretty quickly and let us know that we're all on the same page. Yeah, I, I I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I I certainly would believe that um, there are different emotions, except um, laughter, that you could use to make a social connection. But I, I think sharing laughter has a certain intimacy to it, and I mm-hmm. think that um, uh, it it ha- it's a a quicker way to bond people and um, so I I absolutely would agree with that 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 you know e- even in terms of dealing with a patient physician relationship uh, or a provider client relationship that um, that if you want to develop the, that relationship and that trust uh, laughter can be a, a really great tool to do that mm-hmm. I also think that it, when done in the right way uh, with the patient population, especially your patient population, it also probably brings them back to feeling human again um, and feeling connected again and not just their diagnosis uh, because of the fact of the nature of your diagnosis and what you treat that it would also, I feel, um, 
not lighten the mood because obviously it's a very uh, hard thing to lighten up, but just that remind them that they're human and those other components of what makes us all be. Yeah, you know, I think it's interesting because um, sometimes you sort of think that, well, gosh, this is a serious topic and you always have to be serious. But the fact of the matter is the patients know it's serious. Um, they just want to feel human again. And I think mm-hmm. the laughter, I think the ha- laughter helps them that way. Well, let's take a break for our second commercial. When we get back, let's talk a little bit about the social connectedness and how laughing together does bring us together uh, and the research behind that that is featured in the Time Special Edition, The Science of Laughter. So stick with us. You're listening to Both Sides of the Prescription on BBM Global. Tune in and iHeartRadio. Joseph A. Moylan is the owner of Ion Health, which specializes in very unique medical devices. Ion Health offers biomats, alkalife, and frequency machines. Biomats are a far infrared and negative ion emitting FDA approved medical device. With many different sizes available, you can place them on your bed, on a massage table, or on a seat in your car. It is an unobtrusive way to health. Alkalife machines are water ionizers that cleanse and raise the alkalinity of your tap water, making high alkaline water. Frequency machines utilize certain frequencies to kill viruses and bacteria. These devices are safe and effective. Coming from a health-conscious background and studying physiology at the Academy of Natural Health, Joseph A. Moylan has 15 years of experience in the health field and wants to help you live a healthy, long life. Visit www.ionhealthbiomats.weebly.com or call 765-520-2988. Don't let your health go astray. Get in touch today. Psychologist, master certified coach, and CEO of the executive and organizational development firm True North Leadership, Dr. Relly Nadler brings his expertise in emotional intelligence to keynotes, consulting, coaching, and training. He is the author of Leader's Playbook and Leading with Emotional Intelligence that lays out tips and tools for effective leadership. Dr. Nadler has designed multi day executive boot camps for high achievers in Fortune 500 companies and has coached CEOs, presidents and their staff and developed and delivered innovative leadership programs for such organizations as Anheuser-Busch, BMW, MCI, EDS, DreamWorks Animation, the U.S. Navy and Vanguard Health Systems. To learn more and get your free iPhone app highlighting his tools with videos, leadership keys, visit www.truenorthleadership.com today. Welcome back, everybody, to both sides of the Prescription Radio Show. As we continue our conversation, if you guys want to call in, join in, ask questions, the phone number is 866-451-1451. So, Megan, we had talked a little bit about in the last segment the fact that laughter really serves kind of a social function. Um, You wanted to talk about that a little bit more. Yeah, I think it's interesting because when you look at uh, some of the research that they've started to do on humor and laughter and that connectedness, that first of all, one of the things I thought was the most interesting, which I think we all know maybe um, intuitively or just from simple like day to day life. But um, the fact is, is that we're more likely to laugh with somebody else around, even when that same thing happens, you know, when there is nobody else around, but that we're more likely to laugh when somebody else is around. And I think the statistic, I was uh, trying to sort of look it up pretty quickly, but I think it was like we laugh 30% more in front of, with other people than we do alone. But one of the things that I think is interesting is the fact that we sort of, Uh, I think a repeating theme in this uh, special edition was the fact, too, that uh, we sort of depend on that as a social cue and that, you know, when they talk about a lot of these different um, TV shows and a lot of different experiences, whether or not something was funny, the laughter added in or live studio audiences actually add to 
the effects of laughing and making people laugh more when they hear other people laugh. And so it's just like an instant connected uh, component to it. They've also found through research that we all sort of laugh the same language, that no matter what language you're speaking, we can we know when a French person is laughing. We know when a Chinese person is laughing. We know when somebody from Australia is laughing, that we all know the sound of laughter. And that through that, too, it instantly can sort of um, let us know how that person is feeling and um, what's going on with that person. Yeah, it, uh, you know, I think it from an evolutionary standpoint, that is interesting. Um, and it was something I never thought about. But the fact that uh, we all laugh the same, to me, would suggest that it really is a sort of an, an essential trait that we need uh, to be fully human. Mm -hmm. And another thing that I just thought was um, really interesting is that um, one of the pages, they just said 13 things you probably don't know about laughing um, is that the contrary to popular belief, the number one catalyst for laughter isn't a joke. So it's not someone saying something, but it's actually interacting with another person. And so we're more likely to laugh and smile when we're interacting with somebody else than just from hearing a joke, which I thought was very interesting. Yeah, and I, you know, I think you could, I, I agree with that. I think that that, that is true in my own experience is that um, while I, I've occasionally in a, in a patient situation uh, told a joke most of the laughter that that I've been involved with with my patients um, are, are really due to simply the interaction that we're having and something that comes out in conversation mm -hmm. and and I think that one of the things that um, the laughter does is it is it lets the other person know that you're listening to them Mm -hmm. um, I, yeah, I, you know, I, the laughter indicates that you've committed yourself to not, you know, to listening to that person at, at a little deeper level, um, that allows you to make, uh, some kind of connection that results in the laughter. Well, and in that, uh, one of the examples they gave that sort of relates to that is the chimpanzees and that. Chimpanzees actually, since they're so evolutionary close to us, obviously are studied a lot for these kind of, you know, components and to try to figure out exactly what's happening when two people or a group of people share laughter. But chimpanzees don't technically laugh, they pant. And so they have a panting noise that they make um, that's very similar to what we do with laughter when they're interacting. But it allows them to, um, if you look at what they're trying to uh, uh what's trying to occur when two chimpanzees are sort of panting together is they're letting them know that they're at play, that they're safe here, that this isn't an aggressive behavior, that they're not about to fight, that they are interacting with each other in a playful manner. And I think that that's interesting because we do that with laughter. When we chuckle a little bit, we let that person know, hey, we're here in a friendly manner. You know, we're not going to attack you. And I think in this day and age, more than, I mean, any time in my lifetime, I think we need a little bit more of those cues and social cues of laughter and, you know, chuckling and those kind of things. So we know, hey, we're here in peace. <laughs> we're not going to, you know, get into arguments. We're not going to come at you that we're here in peace. And I think that that's more important today more than ever because a majority of our interaction now during the day is a lot on the computer, whether it's Facebook, emails, you know, things like that, that now those social cues I think are more important than ever because of the fact that we don't interact with people face to face and take those social cues as much as we used to. Yeah, I think, I think that's an interesting point that, um, when they've looked at it in the animal kingdom, it's it, it, it's literally um, a whole different way that they can communicate with each other. Um, and to you know, if you if we look at it also in a different context, a, a lot of the research that's been done um, generally shows that laughter decreases stress. So mm -hmm. it, it decreases the individual stress. And so um, I, I agree with you. I can't imagine that um, 
there there is necessarily been a more stressful time for people um, and anything that can bring that stress level down uh, to me would seem to be extraordinarily um, extraordinarily helpful in our society nowadays. Well, and I think it's interesting, and they don't talk about this in the Time magazine, but it's something that I was thinking of as I was reading some of the articles. It's interesting to me how one of the things that we've made sure to relay over from interaction face-to-face to text messages, sometimes emails and things like that, but any kind of informal um talking over um, social media or texting is to make sure that we have some kind of way to tell people that we're coming at them, you know, with laughter or whatnot, with, you know, either putting ha ha or LOL, you know, and things like that. So it's interesting to me that this is such an important aspect for us to sort of know how that person's coming at you. And when we're talking to someone face to face, chuckling and laughing and whatnot lets us know, hey, you know, this is a peaceful conversation. I'm here to, you know, have fun with you or I'm here to help you. Um, ver- and when there is text messaging, which can often be misconstrued, we have the LOL or ha ha. So we make sure to relay that emotion, um, you know, with different ways and different words and emojis and things like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, so it shows you how important it is and how important it is no matter how our interaction is. Yeah, and I, and I think that um, while it does that, I think um, the other thing it does is it, it puts you in a whole different kind of mind frame um, with regard to the person that you're interacting with, meaning that uh, if, if you're laughing, um, well, we've talked a lot about that in terms of the effect that it has, and I've used, you know, the, in, in my role as a physician with the patient, you know, it's, um, laughter is good for the individual. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. it's 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 um, not only good in terms of how it displays that relationship you have with the other person, but um, it, it affects your, you know, your mindset. Um, it's healthy for you. I mean, there are a lot of physiologic benefits to laughter. Um, and I also think that it's infectious. I think that the more you laugh, the more you're going to laugh. And one of the um, unfortunate things, and this seems to be pretty consistent, um, is that as we grow from children to adulthood, we really decrease the amount of time that we laugh. And, mm. uh, you know, most studies indicate that adults laugh you know, five to 10% of the amount that uh, children do. And um, maybe that's one of the problems that we have um, is that we, um, we aren't doing a behavior that ultimately is, is very healthy. Mm -hmm. Well, and one of the things that I noticed too, from my time as a nurse on the nursing floor, which is, uh, goes along with this too, is the fact that kids, you know, when you take care of sick kids, like if you take care of, you know, kids with cancer, if you take care of kids with any kind of chronic disease or just that are in the hospital for other reasons, they don't want to be sick. They want to play. They want to laugh. They, you know, want to have a good time. I mean, honestly, one of my childhood memories is when I was hospitalized at eight years of age for an allergic reaction to uh, medicine um, when I had asthma and allergies is that after I got hospitalized, I was in there laughing and, you know, wanting to get up and play. And mom said to me, you need to at least look sick or they're going to think you're faking it. And that's kids, you know, kids don't really get that concept. They just want to laugh and have fun and those kind of things. Not that adults want to be sick by any means, because that's not true, but that we, a lot of times I think as adults, don't realize the importance of uh, making sure that we do laugh. And one of the things that this talks about a lot, um, this Time Magazine article, is that our brains don't really know the difference between us faking laughing and really laughing. And so this is a situation where we can even just start out by pretending to laugh more or just, you know, trying to get ourselves to laugh more. And that will lead to us you know, subconsciously laughing more and getting all those benefits of laughter. 
Yeah, I liked your point about kids, and I and you know what. <sighs> If you if you think about that, or if I think about that, you, you know the the child, um, as you said, um, wants doesn't want to be sick, wants to be happy, wants to play, um, and that's not a bad way to live. And as an adult, it really isn't possible the longer you live to to not at some point have something happen to you that's bad but your attitude towards it is kind of everything and mm-hmm. and if you if you recognize that what's happening to you ultimately happens to everybody and you take an attitude well listen i'm you know i'm i'm going to see the bright side of this i'm not i'm going to uh, i'm uh, i'm not going to i'm going to deal with this in positive emotions uh it, it makes it makes all the difference in the world. Mm-hmm. When kids are in the hospital, they want to, you know, we have to schedule in the time that they're going to go play and that they're going to laugh and have fun. We don't do that for adults. And I mean, we don't do that even if you take away the sickness. We don't put in enough play and laughter during the day. And I have noticed a huge difference. You know, it's interesting because even talking to patients about, okay, what do you do for fun? Like, what do you do for stress relief? People say what adults say all the time is I don't have time for that. And it really shouldn't be I, you know, don't have time for that. It should be that you should make time for it because of all the benefits of it. Yeah, that's interesting. And and maybe we can mention in the last segment, but maybe we need to have playrooms for adults in our in our in our clinics. Mm hmm. Yeah, at least. And, you know, this is obviously Dr. Uh, Adams, Patch Adams, the famous movie was made about him but you know this is what he became famous for is that he did put more play in he did you know use humor and those kind of things and he's mentioned a lot in this art uh special edition but that there is a lot of benefit and laughter is medicine and so you know even as we're using whatever techniques we're using in medicine we should definitely not discredit the importance of laughter because it is one of the best forms of medicine healing and promoting longevity in life I think that's true. In fact, um, one of the most poignant stories that really influenced me early on when I began to get involved in um, in talking about humor was um, the story of Norman Cousins. And and uh, maybe after the break, I can talk about that a little bit because uh, I think it, it fits into Patch Adams and it sort of fits in to how this uh, some of the physical effects that this can have. So we will break here for our last commercials. Let's come back and tell the story about Norma Cousins. And then we'll also tell some of our favorite jokes. And that's how we'll end. So come back. We've got some jokes for you so we can all laugh together. So you're listening to both sides of the prescription on BBM Global and Tune In Radio. Certified professional coach Pamela Reeves can help you with your relationships. Motivational and image coaching are just some of the ways she can help you enhance all aspects of your life. Her book, Is It Love or Merely a Sick Attachment, helps readers clearly distinguish healthy, loving relationships from toxic ones. Ms. Reeves has put her words into action through Ray of Hope Kenya, an international initiative that provides outreach to victims of abusive relationships there with the goal of helping them rebuild their lives and the tools to avoid abuse. Ms. Reeves operates various business interests through her umbrella network, Nella LLC, and credits her success to her diverse work experience. Whatever your goals, whether striking a balance, reinventing your image, or simply lifting your lifestyle, Pamela Reeves will help you achieve them. Your life, your call. Dial 410-902-5715 or email Pamela at pamreg01 at verizon.net. She's also on the web at pamreeves.com and on Twitter at Pamela underscore Reeves. America is out of control. Today's capitalism and the approach to money is in fact the symptom of a more widespread pattern of excessive behavior. In his book, The Culture of Excess, How America Lost Self-Control and Why We Need to Redefine Success, clinical psychologist Dr. Jay Slosar portrays an America where excess fuels the drive to succeed. Dr. Slosar examines the cultural factors that lead to excess ranging from obesity to fraud to pervasive budget deficits. His book examines the powerful economic and social factors and their impact on our psychological well-being. Dr. Slosar explores the psychological impact of increasing narcissism, perfectionism, self-destruction, and our identity confusion. 
He offers recommendations for helping Generation Me become Generation We. Those who resist Slosar's message will want to avoid his discussion of regulation and his recent message that at this point, democracy must be more important than today's capitalism. Get his book now online or by visiting thecultureofexcess.com. Welcome back, everybody, to Both Sides of the Prescription Radio Show on BBM Global Tune In and iHeartRadio. So this is a, a pretty common uh, story that's referenced with regard to medicine and laughter, but Norman Cousins was the editor of a magazine called the Saturday Evening Post, and uh, he suffered from a condition that's called ankylosing spondylitis, which is a very severe um, disorder uh, of the skeletal system uh, that results in significant pain. And um, this was during a time where some of the therapies that we have today uh, related to um, autoimmune disease just weren't available. And one of the things that um, he discovered, uh, really self-discovered, was the effects on pain by laughter. And he uh, found out that if he, in fact, uh, laughed, for a certain number of seconds or minutes that it would give him great pain relief for for a much longer period of time and um, he actually actually set himself up where um, he watched uh, old comedy sitcoms um, old comedy movies uh, as therapy for the pain it's interesting is that even though this is a, a long, long time ago and um, and uh, is really more of a kind of a personal experience, it 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 really even affects us today. And, you know, one of the things that's pointed out in the magazine is um, is the number of medical institutions who um, who add laughter into their programs and there are some some um, academic centers which actually have a 24-hour station just for humor that they encourage uh, they encourage patients to look at so um, he to me was uh, really quite an inspiration in thinking about um, how if 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 I uh, seriously took laughter in relationship with my patients how I could be helping my patients Mm-hmm. And I do think, you know, like you said, too, about um, looking and putting people and they were saying they even did during chemotherapy that putting them in front of, um, you know, these shows. And there is a great I, I'm not sure if you ever read Candace Pert and Molecules of Emotion. No, that'd be a good one to talk about or to um, read and do a conversation about because her work now is about 20 years old or even a little bit older. Um, I think it was published about 20 years ago or so and might even be longer than that. But the other thing about laughter and happiness and whatnot is that we know too that that emotion opens us up. It opens up our cells. It takes us out of survival mode where our cells might close down and just try to survive into a thriving mode of being able to open up and be more interactive with the environment. So there's more healing that does occur. And um, Candace Pert's work, Molecules of Emotion, really goes into the physiological um, effects that we see with laughter and happiness and those kind of things. So very, very good book. Um, and, you know, well-documented, well-written, and usually well-referenced to um, when we talk about the effects of happiness and laughter on the cells on the cellular level. Now, to my surprise, and this should prove to people that we don't choreograph these discussions enough, you promised us a joke. I promised we tell a couple jokes because I figured let's leave with laughter. So I thought I'd start out with at the very end of this. So this is a borrow joke. So... Um, at the very end of the Time magazine, the science of laughter that's out right now, um, Steve Martin had a quote that I chuckled at, and it says, a day without laughter is like a day without sunshine, and a day without sunshine is like night. thought that was pretty funny. I did, too. Now, the, the, um, gosh, how long has Saturday Night Live been around? I, didn't they just have, like, their 40th anniversary? Yeah, I was going to say 40 um, years. 
Yeah. So I thought, and and of course, one of the issues that comes into play, we hadn't talked too much about it, but sometimes people get really uptight about, well, gosh, you know, maybe, yeah, laughter is a great thing, but you, gosh, you can't laugh about certain things. Obviously, that's come up, uh, you know, a lot personally with this issue about uh, laughter in cancer patients. But um, where it's also commonly come, came, come, comes out publicly is with natural disasters. And in the United States, uh, it would be hard put to think of, of um, a greater disaster or tragedy that occurred um, in our lifetimes than 9-11. And um, there was a segment in the magazine that I that was interesting when they talked about um, 9-11 in reference to New York City and in reference to one of the iconic programs that um, everyone knows uh, is produced in New York City, and that was Saturday Night Live. And um, Lauren Michaels, uh, the producer of Saturday Night Live, had the unenviable task of of what to do uh, with their first live show after 9/11, and um, what he did, I think, was ingenious, in that he had Rudy uh, Giuliani, the mayor of New York City, come out, and uh, he came out, and they came out uh, among the police and firefighters, and. Um, Michaels looked to Giuliani and paused and just said to him, talking for for, uh, Saturday Night Live, can we be funny? Mm -hmm. And Giuliani, who is not a comedian, who is a public servant, looked at him and said, well, why start now? (laughs) (laughs) Which they, you know, I did not hear it at the time that it occurred, but they said there was nothing that could have been more perfect because um, it basically took the tragedy and um, and said, listen, for sure, we don't want to quit laughing. Yeah. Well, so I have one more joke to leave on, just a silly one, but why don't scientists trust atoms? I don't know why do scientists not trust atoms? Because they make up everything. With that, <laughs> I'll let you think about that. But uh, join us next Wednesday, same time, same place. Um, we'll be back at 9 p.m. Eastern on BBM Global. Tune in and iHeartRadio. We hope you all have a great week. And thanks for listening to Both Sides of the Prescription. Laugh a little bit this week, everyone. You've been listening to Both Sides of the Prescription with your host, Dr. Megan and Dr. Ron. So many times, people are only given one side of the healthcare story. Here, you get both sides. Tune in next week as we discover Dr. Megan and Dr. Ron's Both Sides of the Prescription. You've been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.